This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. This is Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about the coronavirus. No, 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 no. This is about pensions. You know, before the coronavirus thing hit, we were doing a, we had just my co-author and I, Ted Sedell, we had published this book called Who Stole My Pension? It was about the pension crisis. And we decided to just do a Rich Dad Radio program on it because pensions are such a massive subject. And long after the coronavirus is gone, when people wake up one day and they find out they have nothing in their pension, the coronavirus is gonna look like nothing. So we said, okay, so we, so Ted and I got together. So we're gonna to put together a five part series on pensions from different points of view on it, different you know, positions on it. Anyway, it just kept rolling along and more people kept calling in and they had more more points of view on this thing called pensions because you know, as being baby boomers, it's the biggest thing in our lives right now is what happens when I retire? What, happen, what happens if I can't afford to live? So we went from a five part series and now this is part seven in a five part series. So again, I want to introduce our guest is uh, Ted Sedell is a co-author and who's told my pension. He's a former United States Securities and Exchange Commissioner, and he's the world's leading expert in how pensions are looted. And um, I like how he says he says he does autopsies of dead pensions. A yeah. <laughs> good description. And because the military kept sending in such huge, you know, how, how's my military? How's my military pension? You know, after, after all, that's what they stayed in the military for. And then airlines, you know, airline pilots had a lot, their pensions were looted. So killing two birds with one stone, we got my former roommate from Vietnam, Jack Bergman, and he and I were both pilots on the USS Okinawa in Vietnam. And uh, he went on to become a Lieutenant General. And today he is a 22 year commercial airline pilot for Northwest Airlines. And today he is a U.S. congressman, so he's done very well for himself. I mean, we, we all knew, you know, when we were young pilots, young lieutenants in Vietnam in this little aircraft carrier, we knew Jack was going to go far, but not this far, but he's done really, really well. So if I could take a moment, can you all say something real quick? Well, let's see. Jack went on to become a three-star general, and you went on to become in the military a what? Two-time court martial. <laughs> <laughs> just what, saying, just saying. What what upset me was Jack. You know, Jack and I would do the same things, and but I'd always get caught. And that's what Jack said. He's the difference between you and me is you get caught and I don't. <laughs> it's because Jack always had that shit-eating grin on his face and got away with it. So anyway, welcome to the program, Ted and Jack. So welcome. So, <laughs> Thanks so for Jack, being on the show. So cool. Jack, defend yourself first before. You know, because after all, you, you did go a lot farther than I did in the Marine Corps and as a pilot and now in Congress. And uh, anyway, what, what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> well, well no, number one, uh, Robert, I, I appreciate your vote of confidence in my career potential. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> you know, and also um, when you referenced, uh, you know, how we used to... Uh, have that discussion with lieutenants and about, uh, you know, who got caught and who, get, you know, that sort of thing, you know, when, just remember when, when we were youngsters, uh, I don't know about you, but my favorite magazine was mad magazine yeah, mine too. <laughs> and Alfred E. Newman, Alfred E. Newman. I looked like him number one <laughs> and number two, you know, what me worry. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, you know, just, uh, just stumbling through life. But, uh, you know, today, tr seriously, it's a, it's an honor to serve, not only the American people in a different way, but also the people in the first district of Michigan, uh, which is about half the state. Uh, so bottom line is, Hey, I'm, I'm glad to be on the program with you today to talk about everything from airlines to military, to pensions, to you name it. Okay. And then Ted, uh, please give us a little bit of your background. Yeah, Robert. Well, I'm, as you said, I'm a former securities and exchange commission attorney, uh, where I was involved in regulating the, investment world. And uh, I've done over a trillion in forensic investigations of pensions. And the, the, uh, what I've discovered in the autopsies of dead and dying pensions I've done is that the mismanagement of the money in the pensions is what causes them to fail. 
So that's the major uh, thesis of who stole my pension and, and that pensions are being looted by Wall Street. And as a result, uh, pensions of airline pilots, uh, state and local pensions, uh, pensions uh, of all stripes are uh, being stripped from, uh, from the people who they've been promised to. And then also, Ted, you're a, a, what they call a, a whistleblower. Would you explain what a whistleblower is? Yes, I'm also a whistleblower, uh, which is a corporate whistleblower, which is uh, a person who uh, identifies wrongdoing uh, in the corporate world. In my case, I identified wrongdoing at uh, a major American bank and was awarded the highest whistleblower awards in history, $78 million combined, uh, $48 million from the Securities and Exchange Commission, and $30 million from... Uh, the commodities futures trading commission and uh which uh invested in the market is worth a lot less today than it was two months ago that's true that's that is true. true so anyway ladies and gentlemen this is a very very important program i don't care how old you are because this idea what's going to happen with pensions social security and medicare will make covid or coronavirus look like nothing mm. like nothing and again, I just want to reiterate that um, you know a lot of people say, "Well, I don't have a pension. It's, this is not my problem. I don't need to. I don't need to listen to this." But the problem is, somebody's going to pay for those pensions that have disappeared, and it's going to be you and me, the taxpayers. Right. So it is a problem that affects all of us. So the reason we have my one of my dearest, dearest friends, General Jack Bergman, now um, Congressman Jack Bergman, Nancy Pelosi's buddy, buddy, and. <laughs> Ocasio Cortez. Oh, sorry about that, Jack. <laughs> he he anyway. just says these things. <laughs> oh, anyway, Jack. Well, glad maybe may you can get me an introduction to these people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you're buddies with them. You, you have a, you have a way of smiling and getting with you have you have a, you're the best way of getting along with everybody. But the thing is, let's start with the pilot's pension because I was so naive. You know, Jack and I we would go to our squadron Vietnam pilot squadron party, and I'd see my our peers. You know, who were all happy, fat, dumb. They all were flying for United, you know, and they said, you're going to fly for United? I said, no, 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 no. So they flew for United. Jack, would you explain from a pilot's point of view, having flown for, be a captain for Northwest mm -hmm. Airlines, what happened to the United's pension? Well, basically, you know, uh, just to put a little uh, more meat on that bone historically, my first airline was Continental, which went down in 1983 through a strike. And I can tell you, I got a, I got as a settlement for that, a four thousand dollar check. Just so you know, that was my, that was my settlement, total pension settlement, wow. because, based on my years of service. Um, wow. North Northwest, you know, I was, after getting hired by Republic and then Northwest bought Republic uh, in the in the late nineties. Northwest began to fall on, on hard times. And uh, to, in order to keep the company afloat, we, the pilots, took a proactive approach to our basically freezing our defined benefit plan at that point because we had seen what was going to happen within the industry. So when United went down, when U.S. Airways, you know, went down, um, about we as... How about, yeah, Eastern, how about Eastern and TWA? Because, you know, a lot of my guys, that, that's who they flew for, Eastern and TWA, like the losers they were. And they lost, yeah, oh. yeah. And, and TWA, of course, was, was uh, ended up being part of American. Eastern just disappeared. That was part of the Frank Lorenzo era, which, which when you want to start talking about someone who was looking at gutting things, and I believe who this, to this day still needs to be investigated for what he did across the board when it, when it, when it comes to free market uh, economies and, and building companies where, where workers could work their career there and have some level of, of retirement, if you will. But that was not Lorenzo's plan. But all, so he, he ripped that thing apart. What happened to Pan American? Well, Pan American was, um, they got, they got caught not adjusting their business model after the airline deregulation act of 1979. They were largely, uh, you know, before that large airlines were subsidized by the federal government. 
Right. And, and Pan Am never adjusted its business plan because it was still living on the contracts, if you will, mindset that it had during World War II in Korea. Right. But a, a friend of mine was really happy because he got a job flying for Pan Am. And then he got really happy because he got a job flying with United. And now he's unemployed. <laughs> and so Jack and yeah. I, Jack and I are in Pensacola, Florida. We went to flight school and I see all my happy f classmates. And I was so naive, Jack. I didn't know they lost. I didn't know United lost their pensions. So what, what happened to yeah, that? I've, I've got, yeah, I've got, I've got friends today. I mean, both, both, especially the airlines you um, remarked about, especially United, that when it went into the Pension Guarantee Corporation, but PBGC, uh, that, um, that basically was not functioning and is still not set up today, I believe, to best serve the, the needs of its, um, its, if you will, its constituents. Okay, so this is where Ted kicks in because as a former SEC attorney and a whistleblower and all that, he saw the corruption inside the machine. So Ted, what was your, what's your point of view? What did, as an attorney, what did you start to see going on inside these airline pensions? Well, as, as Jack was just saying, uh, I got involved uh, with the United Airlines uh, pilots to meet with the PBGC in 2000, I think it was 2006. Wait, wait, can I interrupt? We, For those who don't know, PBGC is Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, which means that in case the pension, United Pension went down, the PBGC would bail them out. That's as an, as an insurance agency. Kind of like the FDIC for Correct. bank accounts. Correct. Keep going, yeah, the only, thing is, the only thing is, Kim, it's like $54 billion in deficit right now. Oh, so it's not really? at all. Wow. It's, it's basically a taxpayer-funded, uh, uh, they claim to be running on uh, without taxpayer funding, but that's just not true. They're, they're hugely in the hole. Um, but what we said, what the pilots and I said to the PBGC in, back in 2006 is that the government should do a forensic investigation to find out what caused this pension to die before there was any bailout. And the PBGC told us that they had no obligation to do such an investigation, had no capacity to do such an investigation, and had no interest in doing an investigation. And we, we said that the PBGC had taken over at that time more than 4,000 pensions and never once done an investigation into who had taken money out of these pensions, what had caused them to fail. Well, what we learned back in 2006 and again in 2012 when I was engaged by the U.S. Air Pilots to go to the PBGC and demand a forensic investigation is that the government never has done any investigations and has no interest in doing so. And what you see, what happened in the case of United, the pilots had their pensions cut more than 50%. Uh, and the uh, this is what frequently happens and it is substantially running in the red tens of billions of dollars in the red so what you're saying here so jack what, what was your what was your take on it from a pilot side i mean i talked to ted and all those guys who were flying for united and all of a sudden they tell me they have they have to find another job because their pension was gone so what happened from a pilot's airline pilot side well you know uh, when you think about it specific and then more largely in general is that if we as individuals don't have a plan for worst case scenario, now we're, we're talking about personal financial planning here, uh, that to, to just rely on a government for all your big solutions is not a good plan. Think about when the government shut down, you know, a year ago and people couldn't pay their bills being out of work for two weeks. There's no, no rain, no, nobody saves. You know, we, you, we talk about the need for financial education all the time. Too many of my colleagues on the, uh, on the airline pilot side just made an assumption that the, they were going to be taken care of and all was well. And they weren't curious enough to really dig into what, what, you know, was this a house of cards with their, or a, a Ponzi scheme or whatever you want to call it with their pensions and, and, too many of them, and I mean, 
people in general could be could be i think a little but, bit guilty of this is that but isn't other that, people are taking care of you on a macro scale that's the whole economy almost i mean there's so many baby boomers right now who are going to find out there's nothing there well that and that's directly correlates to the coronavirus is people are people are depending on the government to take care of them okay. so when we come back we're going you know so the, the thing the thing that we're saying here is this what ted is saying about the pbjc is that's like having a bank robber know there's no cops out there or a burglar knowing there's no cops out there or a drunk, a drunk driving the car down the road, knowing they'll never be pulled over. So that's what happened. That was the message being passed out there without the PBGC investigating all this corruption, wall street could loot our pensions. And so that's why Ted and I wrote the book who stole my pension because all you baby boomers and you know, children are baby boomers and grandparents are baby boomers. It's all going to come flushing back at you. This whole thing is not going to flush. So we come back, like I said, Jack, Jack Bergman was my roommate on the aircraft carrier in Vietnam. He went on to become a Lieutenant general. He was a 22 year career pilot for the airlines. And today he is a U.S. Congressman from Michigan. So when we come back, we'll be talking because Jack has a very well, big picture viewpoint on what happened to all these pensions. But a big question is what about military pensions has been coming at us a long time. So we come back, we're going into military pensions. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad radio show, the good news and bad news today about pensions. As I said, uh, my co-author Ted Sedell and I wrote a book called who stole my pension. And Ted is a former SSC attorney and we wrote this book and then the coronavirus hit. And so it's just, you know, my, my metaphor is, is like flushing the toilet and it all comes floating back up at you. So right now it's all comes floating back up. So pensions also mean that baby boomers, Medicare and social security and their kids and all this, and this big bailout if they take, they've taken over commercial loans, they've taken over student loans. It's all backing up in the toilet right now. So it's kind of anticlimactic to be talking about pensions when people don't even have a job to earn a pension. That's a very important show. It's going to be a five-part show, five pension time, time bombs. We're now on part seven. And again, the guest today is my former roommate uh, on the aircraft carrier. So Kim, you want to say anything before we go? Yeah, well, you know, you talk, anytime you talk about money and you talk about pensions, not having money, it stirs up a lot of emotion. And there's a lot of emotion right now with people out of work and wondering if they're going to be able to put food on the table. A <laughs> lot of emotion. And Ted, you recently wrote an article for Forbes about military pensions that really got emotions stirred up. And you took a lot of flack. And, what? This is, and this is before the before corona. coronavirus. Yes. <laughs> uh, what what the heck happened? Well, the article is called uh, Mili "Are Military Pensions Too Generous?" Question mark Will they be cut? And we've been getting Robert and I have been getting calls on talk radio about from military personnel saying, "What about our pension? What do you think about our pension? Uh, is it is." Will our pension be reduced? Will our is our pension being looted? What is the likelihood that we're going to experience pension cuts? So I did a little research and I discovered that uh, back in 1985, President Ronald Reagan's budget director David Stockman had called the military retirement plan a scandal and an outrage, and uh, he had taken a lot of heat for that. Uh, but he'd written a definitive uh, study. And so what I said in this article is we will just be taking a look at military pensions. And he had concluded they were too generous um, and that they should be cut. I was simply saying in response to uh, listener interest, we'll take a look at military pensions. And the immediate response I got was, how dare you? Yeah, uh, ladies is, and gentlemen, just for the time, this is February 2020 when this Forbes article popped up before coronavirus and they're already hopping mad, right? Or hot. Right, Ted? Yeah. And the, and the thing is that, you know, the whole thing, and I was simply uh, quoting Stockman and saying, let's take a look. If you want me to take a look, we'll take a look. Let's take a look. And boy, people felt that even looking at this pension was uh, whatever, you know, uh, traitorous, treasonous, whatever. <laughs> So, uh, 
But I think all pensions should be looked at. And one of the reasons we look at the pensions is to determine whether they could be run better and could benefits even be increased. Could we make it safer? Can we make it better? Uh, but people were very disturbed by that. And I'm interested in hearing Jack's point of view. Uh, uh, is everyone in the military uh, um, unwilling to have the, mer- the military pension even looked at? Well, but, but everybody, I want you to know, as a Lieutenant General, Jack makes about 500000 a month from his pension, so he's not going to say anything either, right, Jack? <laughs> well, well, you know, and, and I donate it all, too. Uh, one, one of the most common myths, that, you know, on a, on a, is, is that when I first got elected to Congress, people said to me, well, what are you going to do with that lifetime pension? Now that you're a member of Congress, I said, what are you talking about? And there's a there's myth out there that says once a, a person is elected to the House of Representatives, they get their salary for life. And it's just flat not true. In fact, a person has to serve a minimum of three terms, or five years would be three terms, to actually even qualify for something that may be about $800 a month if you serve the three terms. So there is myth and rumor, but worse than myth and rumor there's some, some cases, some false information out there. And, uh, you know, I, I tell you this, whether a military pension is generous or not, if there's no money in reserve to pay for that pension, then it doesn't really make any difference. It's, 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 uh, it's not a question of the generosity. It's a question of how is it funded long-term so that, cause guess where the pension dollars start? They start in your individual pocket. You pay taxes and that money goes to the government and then they in turn do things with it and in turn give it back to you. I mean, so you're, you're investing in your pension by paying your taxpayer dollars. And if someone is looting that in the, you know, in the middle of it, then something is wrong. And I'm on oversight. Uh, last term I was, uh, the chairman of the oversight and investigation committee for the veterans affairs committee. And our job is to stick our nose in the department of the VA's business to see what they're doing. I'm also now a member of the house armed services. I'm in both those committees and our job as, as federal elect, federally elected representatives is to provide funding and then stick our nose in, in oversight and investigation. So I'm all about looking into the hen house to see if the fox is in there and uh, making the chicken's life a living hell. So I have a quick question, Jack. You know, when you, let's, let's, let's lump government pension, government employee pensions along with the military pensions. How much of that pension money goes to Wall Street and how much comes back from, is, does any go to Wall Street at all or is it just funded by the government? You know, that's a good, I, I don't know the definitive answer to that and that's one of the things that we started looking at because the military just revised their pension plan again for the third time in about uh, three decades. Uh, and you know, only 10% of the men and women, 10% of our citizens, ever serve in the military and only a very small percentage of that 10% serve long enough to actually get a military pension. That's 20 years accumulated service. And most of those others who serve, uh, didn't serve long enough in, in the military to get a military pension get in most cases, some small amount through a veterans, a VA uh, pension usually related to some level of disability. So Ted, do you have any insights as to whether the military pensions are going to wall street? I, I really haven't, I really haven't looked at it. It's, uh, as I said, we've just, uh, you know, put this out there, uh, in re- cause listeners wanted us to look at the military pensions. I don't know for a fact, whether the military pension money has been set aside in, remember the old lockbox? Is it in a lockbox or is this a a pay-as-you-go pension system? I don't know that uh, that, uh, any money has actually been uh, locked away to back these pension promises or not. Um, But if the money has been set aside, it's being managed by somebody. And chances are it's being managed by Wall Street. So, and that's true of all state and local pensions throughout the country, uh, and uh, true of all foreign government pensions too, for the most part. 
they're managed by investment firms. So, uh, and the investment firms are, are more interested in, in doing what's best for them than what's best for the participants in the pension. So that's something we'd like to look at, uh, the military pension system. So Jack, um, because the question that we're asked is the military personnel want to know, will our pension be cut? And of course the worse it's managed, the greater the chance it'll be cut. Any comments on that, Jack? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, and I, I agree exactly with, with what, is, what, what Ted has said, because again, not never intended to be in this uh, federally congressionally elected role, but that oversight, overs, oversight into the, the federal, the, the monies that are, uh, members of the military uh, uh, are being invested on their behalf to to ensure that, in this case, still it's a defined benefit plan as opposed to a defined contribution plan. Um, I believe it is it is important it is essential, if you will. It's part of our role as government to to make sure that no one is uh, stealing from that pot of money. And to use Ted's term, the lockbox. You know, we, we promised in, I think, 1992, then Vice President Al Gore, maybe it was 93, uh, unlocked the lockbox for Social Security that they never put the money back into. So, so uh, once you unlock the box, you got a problem. Right. So let's, let's just, because so we, we have a problem, but uh, while we have Jack on the line and Ted being former SEC, Let's bring in this coronavirus because that's topical today. Jack, from, as a member of Congress, you know, buddies of AOC and Nancy, <laughs> what are you guys doing to protect the public? You know, you know I, I, can't, I can't get her to come to northern Michigan to campaign for me, so I guess she may not be that close. Uh, <laughs> what do you guys see? What, what are you guys talking about in, behind closed doors, if you can say? Well, you know, there's and there's a couple of different conversations going on, but I'm going to give you a, a statement that Vice President Pence made about well eight or nine days ago at one of the afternoon news conferences, and he laid it out very well the roles and responsibilities. He said the federal government, with the exception of uh, running the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and all those things that have, that have to do the research and the science to provide resources on on everything for disease control said the federal government's role here is to support which means fund send money the state's role all 50 states role is to manage the funds that come through and then the local communities or local entities they have to execute the plan to keep their citizens safe because let's face it this the virus travels we don't know exactly how yet but it's geographically centered in different parts of the of the country right now some are getting hit harder than others so when you think about it in our military terms of chain of command and who's where again yeah, federal government supplies the supplies the resources and some some technology and if you will scientific endeavor the states the governors of each state has to lead and their idea of leading can't be just to turn to the federal government and say, send help, send money. Well, you know what? Send, we will, but the governors have to have a plan to lead their states. They are a leader. They're a commander in chief of their state. Okay, Jack, Jack, Jack. So one last, did you see that captain of the Teddy Roosevelt got fired for being a bad leader? I, uh, I did see that. I saw that, uh, in fact, we're reviewing that as it goes here. And uh, some document that he had sent, and I, I don't know what the chain was sending the message up, uh, um, got leaked. And, again, I, uh, we're still investigating what's going on with that right now to see what was the, the reason for the relief. You know, because because we were on aircraft carrier ourselves, and it's very very tight quarters. But apparently, he just got relieved yesterday of his command. So anyway, there's a lot of yeah. stuff happening. A lot of stuff happening. Hey Ted, uh, from a former Ooh. SSC point of view, what do you see going on? You know, behind the behind closed doors. 
Well, I had written this article in Forbes a couple of weeks ago about how Corona is titled coronavirus could kill your pension. <laughs> and it got tens of thousands of readers. And basically what I was saying in there was that if in the 11 year longest historic bull market in history, markets soaring for 11 years, pension benefits around the country were cut half of all state and local pensions were cut since 2008. If in that huge run up in the market, half of all pensions were cut. What do you think is going to happen now in a pandemic environment where the market has plummeted? Uh, and you know, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, this is a time when, as they say, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. Now we're going to see just how badly pensions have been uh, mismanaged because money's not, uh, they're not making money and, uh, in the market. And uh, if the market's up 10% and they're making 5%, they think they're heroes. Pensions always claim their performance is great. If the market's down 30% and they're down 25 or more percent uh, in the, at the end of the fiscal year, it's going to be a, a very bloody tie uh, for, for most of the nation's pensions. So, Jack, let me have one last question. Are you guys planning for civil unrest? Uh, the, sh the short answer is um, no. Well, am I planning for civil unrest? Um, no, Bernie. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Hillary. I, I'm, I'm always, I, I'm planning, if you will, based on where I live, for the fact that good people come together in tough times to figure it out, and everybody's got skin in the game. If there's anybody walking around, on, you know, in the United States today who feels it's, it's about them and everybody has to step up to help them, I would suggest they need to recalibrate their attitude about what it means to be, uh, you know, follow the golden rule, treat others as well, you would want them to treat well, you. Well, Jack, Jack, let me remind you of something. You live in a log cabin up in the <laughs> northwoods of Michigan. You don't live in Detroit, Michigan. You know, your environment's a little bit different. The golden rule in Detroit's a little different than upper Michigan right, in, the, in the woods. And so, so yeah, Jack, that's the, yeah. So that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of our country. We yeah. can live where we want. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so Jack, what do you say to somebody who they're, they're counting on that $1,200 check to keep coming in and that's going to save me and I, I don't have to worry too much because at least I can put food on the table. What do you say to somebody who's thinking that way? Government's well, going to take care of me. Is, yeah, what, I, what I say to that, number one, the government's going to help those who need help in the short term. But if you're work capable and you're not working, then, then the bottom line is we know. I mean, we, we, have a, we had a shortage up until recently here. Now we have, you know, short-term shutdowns of industries because of the response to the coronavirus. But the bottom line is ev everybody needs a hand up from time to time. But when it becomes a handout, that's where it stops because we are better as human beings when we're productive and part of something positive. So I uh, don't expect the government to be continue with a handout, but we will make sure that those in need get that short-term assistance to keep their families afloat and keep their small businesses afloat. Well, you keep, you keep the positive vibe, Jack. That, that's why you made journal and I didn't because I'm the biggest pessimist there is. But anyway. I'll go with the positive vibes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to keep those small businesses going as you know, much as possible. $1,200 is more than I get paid right now, so I'm, I, I can't wait. <laughs> anyway, Ted, final words on pensions. Well, I think, uh, as Jack would say, I, I think that the coronavirus will pass and life will go back normal and coronavirus will not change the world as we know it. That's my perspective. Um, you know, there'll be some short term dislocations, but it's not like the world is going to change dramatically um, in, in the future. I don't, I don't think from this one event, okay. but uh, the continuing, uh, the mismanagement of pensions has been hurting this country, uh, costing it trillions of dollars a year for decades. And that's not, that's not stopping. So that's something that uh, uh, more than ever, we need those dollars. And so to um, get pensions running better, 
read the book, Who Stole My Pension, understand what's going on, and then push to have your pension looked at more carefully. And protect yourselves and your family from the pension crisis. Once again, uh, thank you, to, thank you, Jack. Thanks for taking the time from Congress. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Appreciate it. Always do. Love you guys. Love, Love you guys. too. Thanks, man. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. And we come back with a final word from Kim and myself. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. I want to thank uh, my former squadron mate, Jack Bergman. He's Lieutenant General, of the United States Marine Corps, 22 year career as a commercial captain pilot for Northwest. And um, he's just been a great guy. So he knows a lot about the in, inner workings of government and government, and especially pensions for airline pilots and government employees and military pensions, because he receives them all. And um, this is such a big subject that we'll ha we're gonna have another, another call on this one because Sarah was asking, what were you asking about Sarah on this whole thing? Because you people were asking you. Yeah, there. so that is the number one question I think that we're getting is what's happening with the, the government pensions. But my family, I have two family members that both, one works for DOD, one works for the FFA. Department of Defense. Or FAA, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, when- they're, the they're out of business, nothing's flying. <laughs> yeah, well, no he, and he does, um, he does inspections. So for, uh, w for this medical company, uh, he goes to make sure that they're flight worthy. Um, and when there's a crash, he goes and inspects, he's an investigator. So yeah. fun job, but uh, yeah, they're not very busy. He's in his rental home in Indiana right now, just uh, relaxing and avoiding coronavirus. But he uh, mentioned something to me. We were, so we were talking about government pensions and who, fun, you know, where they invested in. And then he had mentioned to me, I think it was like, maybe early March that when the stock, we started seeing signs of the stock market tanking that he, he moved his stocks where he was invested into his G fund. And so I quickly Googled it during the conversation with Jack and you know, what is the G fund? Um, I don't exactly know what it is other than they invest in the U S treasury. So I think that's a big question we should, should, we should look into is, is that where these pensions are also well, the point is the reason Same. Ted Siddell and I wrote the book, Who Stole My Pension, is because that's a crisis bigger than coronavirus. I mean, you have no idea. The baby boomers have had it easy. Everybody knows that. You know, there were, life was really easy for boomers, but it's gonna get very, very hard now. Not only is coronavirus attacking them, <laughs> The pensions yep, are yeah. attacking them in their old age. And and if you look at it, I mean, all these people, whether it's a pension, whether it's a coronavirus and you're out of work and you're worried about putting food on your table, my fear is, and I think it's true, so many people are depending on the government to take care of them. And as Jack said very, very well, he said, it may be a very short-term solution, but it's not going to go on forever. So you've really got to do something. Think about what is the worst case scenario you're facing right now and come up with a plan. Right, and it, it, we're, we're gonna have more guests on this subject because the question is who's gonna bail who out? You yeah. see, right now, those funds come from either the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank, or do they come from the Treasury? And the big, the big challenge is like these student loans. The reason the student loans are in trouble today was because back in 2009 under the Obama administration to get more people to borrow more money, Obama and his team went to the banks and says, we'll backstop you. Yeah. In other words, if the student defaults, the US Treasury will pay for your loan. So the bank said, oh, thank Jesus. So they started giving student loans out. Now student loans are a bigger crisis than the subprime mortgage was in 2008. Today, the loans are going out to all small businesses under 500 employees, and as long as 50% is not owned by a private hedge fund. So that's, Rich Dad is right in target, target ground zero on that one. And you've so, got to keep your staff employed. You can't yeah. have laid off staff. So the only reason the banks are willing to do it is very much like a student loan, is that the government says, the US Treasury says, if Rich Dad defaults on this loan, we'll pay the loan for you. So the banks are happy to give us the money. So somewhere, it's like I wrote, I wrote in my tweet, you know, about when you flush the toilet, does it come floating up back at you? That's my concern. I think the toilet's flushing right now, and a lot of these loans are gonna come floating to the surface, including pensions. 
including Social Security, including Medicare. So that's why we have the Rich Dad Radio Show, because we'll, t- we'll take a little piece of it each time, and you can listen in and make up your own mind as to what's going on. It's like, you know, Jack couldn't even start. Ted, you know, he's, he is an SEC attorney. He's seen inside the machine how these guys rip off, how Wall Street rips off the government. And I know most of you are surprised, you know, Wall Street would ever do that to us, but surprise, that's what Ted found out. And that's why he says every dead pension deserves an autopsy. And every time he went into the autopsy of a pension, he found Wall Street had been injecting poison into Every time. Every, every time. time. He said mismanagement of funds every time by Wall Street. Every time. So this, it's the same thing happened to us, ladies and gentlemen. Look, this coronavirus is seri- serious, but if you're healthy, you have a better chance of getting through. And if you get through it, you'll be healthier if you survive the virus. But if you're weak, you're going to die. And it's the same as your pension. If you're weak financially, you have no financial education, you're going to die. Either way. So that's why with the Rich Dad Radio program, we don't give you any answers, but we just try and make people more aware. So we thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio program. Uh, Sarah, we'll, we'll look into this G fund and find out what that means. And we'll talk to Ted. Anyway, I want to thank Jack and Ted Sedell. Thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show.